We begin with the reality that it would be nothing less than dishonest to talk first about the Philadelphia 76ers winning a game or the NFL playoffs or Torrey Hunter's classlessness or anything else. Went out this window, literally 50 feet from this chair. This was happening last night and will again tonight. And what this is about intersects with sports whether you like it or not. Whether or not you think of sports as a haven or a break from this, whatever you want to believe or want to believe or believe that this doesn't touch you, the death of a man on Staten Island, New York, or an incomprehensible struggle between a teenager and a policeman outside St. Louis or any of a dozen other cases. Wish it away all you want. It exists, and it is in sports. There's also a protest in Boston tonight. Some Lakers reportedly plan to participate. And you had better participate with the rest of us in figuring it out and fast. And I can think of nobody in sports better qualified to help us process all of this than ESPN senior writer Howard Bryant, whose perceptive and communicative skills were already sufficient for this purpose, even before his life was touched by the escalating conflict between the police and African Americans and others. Thanks for coming in, Howard. No, thanks for being here. Good uh, to be here. <laughs> set the parameters for us. Why are these protests a sports story? Well, it's something that you had said earlier about there's no separation. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the interesting parts of this is that you're dealing with something that is not in theory to a lot of these African-American players. It's not a concept or a topic to them. It's real. And whether you're talking about the St. Louis Rams, when you're looking at Kenny Britt saying, my kids matter. It's not black lives matter. Right. My life matters. And I think that what's really important about this now is that there is no separation. There is no standing behind any sort of shield. I think the players are now recognizing that they are part of this and that there's a solidarity with a lot of those communities, a lot of the African-American communities that have to deal with this every day. There's not a person, I don't believe, to go into any clubhouse in America where an African-American player could tell you that he hasn't had some mm -hmm. sort of confrontation or some sort of experience with the police. Is, is that disconnect like so many things in our society and in sports, is that disconnect based on whether or not you've had personal experience with it or whether or not you've been close to personal experience? Well, I think actually what's really interesting about this to me is Kobe Bryant, of all players, yeah. saying that it's the system. Finally, I think that people are recognizing that the legal system between African Americans and white America, the viewpoints are so stark. The experiences are, are, are so, the contrast is so great that when something happens like this, it's personal to the African Americans because we're the ones in the target. Mm -hmm. And I always say constantly, it's not the same if you're the target. Uh, do you want to talk about that? The, the day you were the you were the target, whether it was tar tar target in the in the in the literal sense or just in the inadvertent sense? Well, I mean, it's not. I mean, it's happened to me before. I think Jeez. that. Um, I mean, I remember. Goodness, I remember when I was in college. I mean, there there were so many examples. And I don't always get into trouble. I got into an argument with my wife in, you know, three years ago. And we weren't even arguing anymore. We were done arguing. We were sitting on the street. And then the police came over and completely overreacted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, took me away. And, and I didn't resist or anything. But the problem with it was it wasn't just the fact that I got arrested. It wasn't just the fact that I got arrested in front of my six-year-old. And that there was no cause for this, in my opinion. It was that... The police had no accountability whatsoever. To this day, even after everything else was dropped, even after everything proved that I hadn't done what I had been accused of doing, mm -hmm. they have to pay no price. And I think that's the question where you're looking at Eric Garner and you're looking at Ferguson and you're looking at Tamir Rice, depending on what happens there, and you look yeah. at, at, at all these cases, it's the, you're starting to wonder, is there any accountability and the video? One thing about this that does get me is that We've talked about Ray Rice and domestic violence. And we right. talked about the right. difference, the tipping point here was the video. Well, we had a video here, and it didn't prove to be a tipping point. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting thing about a video, because sometimes a video just serves to tell you what you already know. Yeah. I lived in Los Angeles, and at the end of the six years or so that I lived in Los Angeles, the Rodney King tape popped up, mm -hmm. and I was at a different station than, than ran it. And I, I remember distinctly, somebody told me, you won't believe what, what we're going to show tonight. And I, they, they described it. And we all knew things like that happened in L.A. a lot. A lot. I'd seen them. Yeah. And I said, so where is it in the show? And they well, we're going to do about 20 minutes in. It wasn't the lead story yeah. that night because people knew these things happened. And I suppose that when you, and when you accept it, 
the, the way against acceptance is, is protest and I suppose uh, personal experience or being literally next to it, 50 feet away yeah. from, from something that happens or a protest that occurs. Yeah, and, and I think that one of the interesting things about it that, that gets to me when you look at the conversations we have when it comes to athletes mm -hmm. is that this is not part of their lives, it is part of their lives. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so directly connected to them. And I think this is one of these areas where you think about this tipping point, this awakening. And I see that with the players here. But now we know what the players can do. We know what they can do. Can, can the leagues do anything? Can, I mean, can the NBA or the NFL or baseball or even hockey step up in some way here? No, I think this is America. This is what's happening. And what's happening here, what I, what's, you know, what's, what's happening is, is that there's no separation between the, the disconnect that's taken place in the African-American community and what's happening in other areas with the leagues. Mm -hmm. And in that the leagues have made sports political. The tie-in post 9-11, we have a military night every night. I don't yeah. think you can always separate the war from the warrior. So there's no, there, there's no area, there's no haven anymore. And now the social side of it in this country, first it's international, now it's national. And sports is a big part of that and there's kind of no getting away from it. Remember when we were coming up in the business, there was no news on the sports page. Now sports has been completely politicized. And I don't think you can separate the two because the African-American experience is so stark and the number of players is so large that they have to have a right to express how they feel. And sports has always led the way, uh, in many respects, well ahead of the rest of society. Maybe there's a way for it to happen again, even if it takes the athletes who are willing to risk, like the Rams guys and maybe these Laker guys too. Yeah. Howard Bryant, thank you.